And once again, good morning. And welcome to Community Christian Church. So good to have you with us. How many of you know what today is? It's November 1st. Isn't that crazy? November. You know what that means? Christmas is right around the corner. Has anyone even thought about Christmas yet? I knew there'd be a few. But I'm still stuck in July. You know, thanking God for the absolutely beautiful Michigan summer he provided us with this year. And how many of you know we needed it badly? We needed the sun to shine. We needed the weather to be nice and to be warm. And God gave us a gift. And so I'm going to go out on a thin limb here, and I'm going to predict a beautiful Christmas season this year. Even for those of you who typically don't get real excited about the holidays, I'm anticipating a better than average Christmas blessing on the horizon. And right about now, some of you are thinking, well, Pastor Tony, is that the Spirit of God talking, or is that just you? Is that hope, or is that optimism? Well, probably a little bit of both, with a tad of wishful thinking. But the last time I looked, we can still dream, right? So let's think big for the final couple months of this year. All right. As you just heard Megan say, we're going to begin a new series today. It's called Matters of the Heart. Can I get you to say that? Matters of the Heart. One more time. Matters of the Heart. And how many of you know with God, the heart is what matters most? Typically, people focus in on the outward appearance. We make judgments and we formulate opinions based on what we see. But God doesn't operate that way. God looks at the heart. He's like a mega MRI. And he has advanced imaging capabilities. I mean, he can see every tiny little detail. But God doesn't look at the heart or perform a cardio CAT scan just to point out all of our flaws. That's not what an MRI is all about. That's not the purpose of an MRI. When you go to the hospital to get an MRI or to get x-rays of any kind, you do that so that doctors and surgeons can make a precise and accurate health assessment. And then with chart or image in hand, they can prescribe for you the absolute best medical treatment possible. And with regard to matters of the heart, the spiritual heart, God's ultimate plan for each one of us is to change and transform us from the inside out. Amen. You know, cleaning up the outside a bit, that's definitely a step in the right direction. But God's number one goal is extreme makeover. And I'm talking about a total heart renovation. You see, in Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 26, God said this. He said, here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to remove from you your heart of stone, and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. God said, this is what I'm going to do in your life. I'm going to take away from you your natural heart of stone, and I'm going to replace it with a heart of flesh. The, new, the Living Translation says, a tender and responsive heart. And friends, I'm sorry to say that when we become Christians, this doesn't happen automatically. It does not happen overnight. I wish it did. I wish on day one of our conversion, we would no longer have to deal with a stubborn or a self-centered heart. But that's not the case. Heart transformation takes time, requires precision and expertise. And thankfully, Jesus, our great physician, also just happens to be the most skilled heart surgeon on the planet and beyond. And he knows what he's doing. And so our combined goal and objective for the next couple of weeks is to go after the heart. It's to see God create in each one of us a soft, and sensitive and caring and responsive spiritual heart. And Jesus basically said, in the last days, 
And how many of you know that's the time frame that we're living in right now? I'm convinced of it because a couple of months ago in September, we did a series called End of Days. And during that series, we determined that we are living in the time frame called the last days or the end of days. And Jesus said in the last days, if we're not careful, if we're not proactive, if we don't make the matters of the heart a top priority, then the love of many would grow cold. And that means the exact opposite would happen. That people who have already established some kind of softness in their heart, because of what's happening in our day, they would allow those circumstances to harden the heart. And a, a soft, pliable, responsive heart will be, in turn become callous and cold and insensitive. And we all have to guard against that. And so today, in lesson number one of this series, entitled Matters of the Heart, I want to talk about having a servant's heart. Can I get you to say that? A servant's heart. And whenever we talk about this particular subject, there's a passage of scripture that I absolutely love. It's found in the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. In your relationships with one another, does it say in your relationships with God alone? In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. Is that what it says? He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And of course, we can't quote Philippians 2, 5 through 8 without adding or including verses 9, 10, and 11. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every name, in heaven, on earth, and even below the earth, and every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, with humility comes great exaltation. And God said it. He said it in his word. He who humbles themselves shall be exalted. So the key to this entire passage that we just looked at, it's found in verse 5, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, where Paul says to us or instructs us that we are to have the same mindset that Jesus had. And tell me again, what was Jesus' mindset? A servant's heart. In fact, in Mark chapter 10 and verse 45, Jesus said to his disciples, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but what? To serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And this is what we were singing about this morning, and I, I trust that you felt the cloud of God's glory and presence fall on us as we exalted the King of kings and Lord of lords. You see, Jesus laid down his life for us. He paid the price for our redemption. He said there could be no more meaningful or powerful sacrifice than that. His exact words, greater love has no man. There's no possible love that can be any greater than a man or a woman laying down their life for their friends. And Jesus, by laying down his life on the cross, he revealed to us the greatest story ever told. It's a powerful, very meaningful sacrifice. Now, personally, I love success stories. When somebody hits it big, or when they experience an unexpected windfall of some kind, I'm all about cheering them on and offering congratulations. The truth is, I can get really emotional and move to tears when I hear someone giving credit to someone else who's helped them, like a parent or a grandparent, a friend or a mentor, to say something like, I wouldn't be where I am today 
without the sacrifice or the support that my parents or my grandparents have given to me. See, those kinds of testimonies, they inspire me. And you hear that kind of, of testimony coming from accomplished athletes all the time where they give credit to someone for their success. Or people have climbed the corporate ladder and they've been promoted all the way to the top. Oftentimes during celebrations or when they're giving speeches, they will say, I owe this one to my spouse to my wife or to my husband because all during the time that I was in training and when I was working countless hours or when I was going to school, they held down the responsibilities at home. They took care of the kids. And I'm so appreciative and grateful for the sacrifice they made for me. You see, those kinds of stories, they move me. And just a couple of months ago, following the death of world-renowned apologist Ravi Zacharias. I was watching his memorial service live-streamed from Atlanta, Georgia. And his daughter was talking. She was giving the eulogy. And she said a short time before her dad died, before Ravi, Ravi passed away, because he was so sick and it, it, it was just really a difficult time for them, a challenging time. He was isolated away from the family for several weeks. He was all by himself. And right before Ravi died, her eight-year-old son came to her. And he said, Mom, I need you to tell me what's going on with Papa. I need to know. I haven't seen him in a couple of weeks. I haven't had a chance to talk to him. We haven't been interacting. Nobody's telling me. I have to know what's going on with Papa. And his mother, doing the absolute best job that she possibly could, uh, broke the news to her son that his grandfather was not going to make it, that he was very sick, and she said she was sorry. She didn't have all of the answers. She couldn't explain to him. Uh, why, but he was going to be with Jesus soon. And when this little eight-year-old boy realized that he would no longer be able to interact with his grandfather, that his grandfather was going to die and go to be with Jesus, he said, Mom, you don't understand. Without Papa, I can't be me. Without Papa, I can't be me. In other words, his grandfather meant the world to him. You see, that's what it means to have a servant's heart. To care so much about the well-being of somebody else that they become the top priority in your life and you choose to put others first. And that's precisely what Paul said in the couple of verses preceding the ones we just read. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Here's what he said. Do nothing, how much? Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others, or to the interest of the others. Why would he say that? Why would Paul lay out such radical instruction and doctrine that we are in humility to value others above ourselves? Why would Paul say that? Well, two reasons. Number one, it's the way Jesus lived. It's how Jesus lived his life. It was the mindset of Jesus. And correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't Christianity supposed to be us following and emulating his example? Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Aren't we supposed to imitate Christ in our actions and in our behavior and our thoughts? So number one, that's how Jesus lived. And number two, this is the formula for lasting happiness. Let me say that again. This is the formula, Philippians 2, 3, for lasting happiness. Servanthood or learning to possess a humble, selfless attitude toward others is the key to happiness. Some of you are looking at me right now like you don't believe me. 
Well, listen to the hot off the press statistics uh, coming from the NORC, the National Research Center at the University of Chicago, which just so happens to be the largest and most reputable research organization anywhere in the world. According to the NORC, just four months ago in June of this year, they surveyed a bunch of people, tens of thousands of people, and the results of that survey revealed that 86% of the people surveyed said they had very little joy in their lives. 86%. When asked to pick between happy or unhappy to describe the way they feel, 86% said unhappy. Do you know how much 86% is? That's almost 9 out of 10 people. Look around you. Nine out of ten people said they were unhappy. Uh, that means that a good majority of Americans are definitely not happy campers. And I'm sure all of the adversity that we've faced so far this year and everything that we've been through has contributed to these negative numbers. They, it, it's influenced it, no doubt. But as you well know, in this life we're always going to face negative circumstances, all of the time. It's always going to be adversity and challenging days. So why in the world are we so unhappy? Why are we so unhappy? I have the answer. How many of you want to hear it? Probably don't want to hear it. Here's the answer to the reason why we are so unhappy today. It's found right here in this life-changing, life-altering verse in Philippians 2.3. The passage we just read a few moments ago. Let me refresh your recollection. In humility, we are to value others above ourselves. Friend, that's not just one little tiny verse. That changes everything. Amen. And it's all linked to following and emulating the example that Jesus gave to us. Paul cries out, let this same mindset that was in Jesus be in you. Let it be in you. In humility, value others, not a period, but value others above yourselves. And friends, if we were honest this morning, we would have to say, we're not doing that. That is not the way we live. In fact, in America, we are programmed for self. And we are, for the most part, engaged in self-centered activity. And please, don't anyone misunderstand or misquote me. I'm not saying that we don't care about people, that we don't love one another, or that we don't reach out to people when they're in need. Come on, we do that. In fact, this church has proven to be the most generous congregation on the planet. And I greatly commend you for that. I mean that with all of my heart. But generosity is only a portion of what it means to possess a servant's heart. Do you know we can be generous because God has blessed us with so much? And we can share some of those blessings with the people around us and still live self-centered lives? Still be fixated and focused in on our own thoughts, our own desires, our own needs? We can still do that. Again, according to the research, here's a short list of daily life activities in modern America. These are the things that most Americans get involved with most. Working on quality relationships. Becoming more educated and better informed. Striving for performance and promotion. Experiencing adventure and thrills. Whipping ourselves in good physical shape at the gym. Improving our diets. Managing our money. Upgrading our living space. The list goes on and on. And while all of what I just mentioned is extremely essential and important, and in balance, it's all biblical, it's all scriptural, and I would highly recommend it, check this out, not one thing on this list, nothing that I just mentioned, will bring you lasting happiness. Not one. And that's not my opinion. 
That's what the NORC in Chicago concluded after interviewing tens of thousands of people. They reported that the majority of the people surveyed said they have worked their whole lives to accomplish what I just described, and they have not been able to find happiness. You see, true happiness doesn't come from human achievement. Checking all the boxes on a lengthy bucket list is not going to get you there. Philippians 2, 3, and many other verses in the Bible tells us, it says very clearly, lasting happiness can only come from having a servant's heart. And not just your willingness to serve God or to love God, but in humility, valuing and serving other people above yourself. Amen. Friends, I would encourage you, jot that verse down. Put it in your phone. Put it somewhere where you can get a hold of it each and every day and memorize it because it is a life-changing passage of Scripture for every single one of us. Now, as we begin to prepare for our communion service, and it's still just a few minutes away, uh, the, the word that I used there was to begin. Uh, as we begin to prepare uh, for the communion portion of our service, I want to read a passage of Scripture found in the Gospel of John, John chapter 13, and none of the other gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, or Luke, record this particular passage in their gospels. It is a, exclusive to the gospel of John. John chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothes, wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. All right, let's stop right there. A week or so ago, as I was preparing for this particular message, the Spirit of the Lord led me to the passage that I just read, John chapter 13. And after I reviewed it and read it, just like we read it a few seconds ago, I became fixated on the last part of verse 1. John chapter 13 and verse 1. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. And the, the, the passage or the, the sentence that seemed to captivate my attention was, he now showed them the full extent of his love. So I sat there in a rare moment in front of my laptop thinking about that one sentence, reading it over and over again, meditating on it, praying about it. And this is no exaggeration. I sat there for 30 minutes without typing a single word on my laptop because I kept asking the same question, Lord, what does this mean? What does this mean? You know, sometimes we can just race through the scripture and something might get a hold of us and, and, and we don't give it the time to, to meditate on it and to, and to think about it, but for some reason, I couldn't get past that one verse. I thought about, you know, Jesus expressing his love to his disciples for three and a half years with a great amount of love, teaching them, spending time with them, mentoring them, feeding them physically and spiritually, literally taking them by the hand and showing them the heart of God, something they had never seen before. They would have never been able to know without Jesus giving them that information. What did it mean? He now showed them the full extent of his love. And I know that the cross was the single greatest act of love that anyone could possibly demonstrate. And Jesus about to go to the cross was a part of that. But the verse says, now. 
he now showed them. It doesn't say he was about to show them. It doesn't say they would soon learn all about his uncon unconditional love. Verse 13, 1b uses the word now. So whatever Jesus had in mind, it was about to take place in that moment. And at that very moment, at that time, Jesus noticed that his disciples were sitting at the table, the evening meal or the main course was being served, and they still all had dirty feet. He noticed that. None of the other guys noticed. They were clueless. But Jesus saw they're about to have the main meal and everybody's got dirty feet. So he got up from the table. He took off his robe. That's what the Bible says. Took off his outer garment. And when he did, he revealed the undergarment that he was wearing. The same piece of clothing that the Roman Praetorian guards refused to cut up and divide at the crucifixion site. Do you remember that? They were so impressed with this one garment that instead of doing what they typically would do, which is to tear it up and divide it among themselves, they didn't do that. They didn't want to destroy it. So they gambled for it. Remember? They cast lots for it. They wanted to see who the lucky one was who was going to take home Jesus' underwear. You see, that particular garment was a very rare piece of clothing. Someone had taken the time to weave it as one piece from the top to the bottom without any seams. It was amazing. Held that garment in their hand. Couldn't believe it. How, how did somebody do this? You see, it was the same holy piece of clothing that the high priests would wear when they were ministering before the Lord. That's the garment that they would have on when they were ministering in the holy place. But I'll tell you this, no high priest, no Jewish high priest would have ever even thought about taking on the assignment of washing dirty feet. I mean, the high priest was highly esteemed among all the people. The entire uh, Jewish community thought the high priest to be as close to God or as near to God as you possibly could be. And no menial task of washing feet would have ever been assigned to a high priest. But Jesus, our great high priest, that's how the book of Hebrews describes him, a priest after the order of Melchizedek, a heavenly high priest, he humbled himself. And taking on the form of a servant, he grabbed a basin and a towel and he washed his disciples' feet. All of them. All 12 disciples. And when he was finished, he went back to where he was seated. And the scripture says as soon as Jesus returned to continue with the Passover meal, John chapter 13, verse 21. As soon as he returned from washing his disciples' feet, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, one of you is going to betray me. Do we have that verse, guys? John chapter 13 and verse 21. Do you see it? We don't have it? Getting no response. One more time, John chapter 13, verse 21, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, one of you is going to betray me. Any idea why Jesus was so troubled? I know you're thinking about something. You don't want to say it out loud. He had just washed Judas' feet. And all during the time, that he was washing his feet, he was thinking about what Judas was prepared to do, to sell him out. And not just betray him, but the scripture says he betrayed Jesus with a kiss. How many of you know that wasn't easy for Jesus to digest? Judas 
was one of the 12 disciples. He was a, a chosen disciple, a brother, a close friend. They did ministry together. These 12 guys plus Jesus, they did life together. They shared meals. They shared secrets. And now Judas is getting ready to stab Jesus in the back. And all during the time that Jesus was washing his feet, he's thinking about it. Gets back to the table, and he's not just a little upset. He's troubled in spirit. Check it out. Human betrayal happens all the time. And I would venture to say that we have all felt it. We've all felt its sting. Every single one of us has probably experienced a close, loving person, a friend, maybe even a family member, say something, do something that has offended us. And it hurts. Betrayal hurts like crazy. And please believe me when I tell you, I know what it feels like. I know how betrayal can hurt. But here's what I've learned. As much as I wish it were not so, I have hurt and offended other people as well. People who have put their trust in me. People who have gained my confidence. People who have held expectations. And when I didn't meet those expectations, when I offended other people, they felt the sting of betrayal. They would testify to you today that I betrayed them. There are people walking around this earth, people that are alive today, that I have offended. It wasn't intentional. Certainly didn't do it on purpose. But it happened, and it hurts. And I need to ask those people to forgive me. In John chapter 13 and verse 1, Jesus said, I'm now going to reveal the full extent of my love. And he got up from the table, and not only did he wash the feet of his betrayer, he chose to wholeheartedly forgive him. And don't think for a moment it was easy. Don't think that betrayal and that emotional pain came into Jesus' heart and evaporated quickly. It did not. The Bible says he was troubled. He was devastated. He was crushed. But he chose to extend grace and mercy. He chose to reveal to us the heart of the Father. And it's the heart of a true servant. That's what it means to have a servant's heart. It's to allow the full extent of God's love and power to come into your heart and to also be reflected and revealed in your own heart. Not just loving God, not just serving God, not making a commitment to obey the commandments of God, but in humility, valuing others above yourself, even people who have offended you. Okay, at this time, I'm going to ask you to please bow your heads and we'll prepare for communion. Father, we thank you for your presence that's in this place right now. We thank you, Lord, that you are here among us. And Lord, as we begin this series, the first of November, as we talk about matters of the heart, we take that next step, Lord, and we just open our hearts to you. Not just so you could take a little peek at what's inside, Father, we are making bare before you all of our emotions, all of our feelings, everything that we possess because we need you, Lord. More than ever before, we need you to come in and work your ministry in our hearts, taking away the stony places, removing the hardness and the calloused areas and bringing softness 
and tenderness and responsiveness. Lord, we pray in these moments as we gather around the communion table that you would do something so uncommon and unique among us. Lord, that you would, in fact, extend to us the same way that you did with your disciples a long time ago, the full extent of your love. Lord, we need it. We desire it. And you are in position to grant it to us. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, have your way during this communion service. Every time we meet together for communion on the first Sunday of every month, I always share a portion of scripture with you found in the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In fact, that's the very passage that Paul uses to introduce the communion service to the church. And here's what Paul said. For I receive from the Lord what I passed along to you. In other words, Paul said, I wasn't there when Jesus initiated the communion service with his disciples. I wasn't a participant when he got up from the table and he washed all the feet of his disciples. I wasn't even saved yet. I didn't know anything at all about what was taking place on that night and how important it would be for the church going forward. And so the only way that I could have known what happened on that occasion was Jesus himself making this information known to me. And so he revealed it to me. He told me all about it. And Paul says, here's what Jesus told me. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread. Not the night before his arrest and subsequent crucifixion on the cross. Not the night that he gathered together with his disciples and shared the Passover meal, his last one, by the way. Not the night that he got up from the table and washed everybody's feet. But on the night he was betrayed. You see, betrayal hit Jesus hard. He had a difficult time with betrayal. And when it happened, he looked Judas right in the eye and he said, are you really going to do this now? You really want to do this to me? Are you going to betray the Son of Man with a kiss? With a holy embrace? Is that your objective? And if you read between the lines, betrayal crushed Jesus. It broke his heart. It probably hurt him as bad as the beating. Because this was a close friend who was betraying him. And you know what's amazing to me? That following the resurrection, I mean, Jesus is back with the Father. He's ascended to his throne in heaven. It's months and maybe even years later and the betrayal is still on his mind. He's still thinking about it. How do I know that? Because he has a conversation with Paul after the fact and tells him all about it. In the vision that he had with Paul or however he made that revelation known to him, whether it was through a dream or, or through personal revelation, however it was that Jesus revealed to Paul about the communion uh, supper, he's talking about the betrayal. It's still on his heart. And Paul attaches it to the communion supper information so that every time we gather together at the communion table, whenever we hold the bread and the cup in our hands, not only do we recall and remember Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and all that he did for us when he died there, we are compelled to think about the betrayal. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. Wow. Wow. 
Jesus bringing up the betrayal to Paul, Jesus having conversation with him, telling him how it went down, leads me to believe that when we are betrayed, when we experience that hurt in our lives, it can remain there long after we offer forgiveness. Think about that. That was worth you getting to church today or tuning in. Long after you have forgiven the person who has let you down and betrayed you, it's still there. Even when you let go of it, it's still there. And when you find yourself thinking about it and you find yourself depressed and it gets you down and you got to talk to somebody about it and you have conversation, it doesn't mean that you haven't extended forgiveness to people. It doesn't mean that you're walking in unforgiveness or you've violated God's commands. It simply means we need the full extent of God's love. Every one of us not just his unconditional love, not just his covenant-keeping love that he gives to us, having loved those who are in the world, he now ex expressed to them, he extended to them the full extent of his love. That's what we need. It can only come through a servant's heart. Jesus was the only one who could reveal it. He's the only one who could show it to us. And we have this gift. We have this power. And not only can we receive it, we can reflect it. We can give it to the world around us. We can bring healing to the people who are hurting. Can I get you to bow your heads, please? Again, the scripture says it was on the night Jesus was betrayed that he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. Jesus' body was broken so that we could be healed from our brokenness. I'm going to say that again. Jesus' body was whipped, it was broken, so that we could be healed from our brokenness. And that's all that we're going to get in this world, friends. You are not going to get wholeness in this world. Wholeness only comes from the kingdom of God. Could you lay down your pain and your hurts? Could you lay down all the brokenness that you're feeling right now, whether it's self-inflicted or it's come at the hand of somebody else? Would you allow the full extent of Jesus' love to heal your broken heart? Father, do it by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, you only need to touch us just send the word and we'll be healed. Let's take the bread together. After supper, it ended, Jesus took the cup. Again, he gave thanks. He passed the cup to his disciples. He said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often, every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you declare the Lord's death till he comes. Jesus went to the cross. He died there. He said, it is finished. There remains no more sacrifice for sin. He shed his blood for our redemption. With his blood, he bought us back to God. And he gave us the gift of forgiveness. Say that, forgiveness. 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 The scripture says, if you confess your faults, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Forgiveness is the gift that God gives to us because of our tendency to break his laws and his commands in sin. We don't have to walk around in shame. We don't have to hang our heads and think that God doesn't love us or care about us. He's offered to us forgiveness. Do you need his forgiveness this morning? Do you need the forgiveness of someone else that you've offended? It's available. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that we can forgive and we can receive forgiveness. 
Lord, we confess our sins. There are many. We confess our faults and we confess the times that we disobey and we don't live our lives according to your commands. That doesn't mess you up. That doesn't cause you to be put off with us because you gave us a gift to deal with our rebellion and sin. It's the forgiveness that comes from the cross of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord God, it would be real in the life of every person here today. Thank you for redemption and forgiveness. Let's take the cup together.